Welcome back to the Redacted Culture Cast. Today, I am joined by another guest who has been on the show. Um, Ian, you've been, you're, you run Ruin Nation, you're a trainer, you do a whole bunch more, but we also tend to have really good conversations about not only gun culture, but things that we find to be right and true and good. And before we get too far into it, I'd really like you to introduce yourself one more time. Sure. Uh, my name's Ian Strimbeck. I am the owner and founder of a company called Rune Nation. I spent some time in the Marine Corps from 2006 to 2010. Of that time in, um, I spent all my time in the infantry realm. I was stationed with 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines down in Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. I uh, spent some time overseas from 07 08, and then I was all over the Mediterranean basically for all of 2009. Uh, when 2010 rolled around and they offered me the Reenlisten packet. I said I'm all set, but I'll take that GI Bill money. <laughs> so I uh, ended up going back to, well, not going back to, just going to college after uh, the, the military. I jokingly say that I was unfortunately born in the very draconian and communist state of Massachusetts. So uh, when I got out, I went back to Massachusetts and went to Salem State University from 2010 to 2014. Within those four years, I uh, gained my uh, my uh, bachelor's degree in communication with a concentration in journalism, and then I also minored in psychology. Uh, while I was in college, uh, obviously you got to start kind of figuring out what you want to do after the military. So I ended up working for a locally based uh, firearms training company in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it's very long and drawn out process in order to not only potentially carry a firearm concealed, but just to simply purchase one legally. Um, so I worked with a company and basically taught what was called the BFC or the basic firearms class for the state of Massachusetts. It's a very, you know, I, I, I like to say it's a, it's death by PowerPoint for six to eight hours. There's no live fire involved, surprisingly enough. It's just basically like, here's a muzzle, here's a trigger, don't shoot yourself in the face. Here's snap caps to know how to load and unload a single action revolver, double action revolver, uh, semi-auto pistol, double action, single action, single action only, double action only, uh, lever action rifle, pump action, uh, semi-auto, et cetera, so forth and so on. And uh, did that for a few years just to get reps, just kind of uh, teaching and teaching a curriculum. And from there, I also worked for an executive protection firm out of the Gary Boston area. We worked alongside international dignitaries, such as when the Dalai Lama was visiting, doing his public speeches, his talks in Boston. And also we worked with uh, VIPs and celebrities that were visiting the Boston area, such as say when the Rolling Stones were doing their concert tour back in the 2011-2012 uh, timeframe. And then of course I did, I did your very stereotypical door work at really, we'll say less than desirable bars and less than desirable areas of Boston. And that really opened my eyes to the normalcy of everyday criminal interaction, how fast and how violent things can become in very small and compromised spaces, such as a bar space. And it was around, uh, not when I started doing door work, before that I started doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which definitely assisted my efforts when doing door work, being in that close proximity with people. And I've been doing Jiu Jitsu now for almost 11 years. I was just promoted a brown belt recently, which for those who are not in the know, in Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu curriculum, brown is one below uh, black belt. Um, other than that, I uh, after I left Massachusetts, I really had no rhyme or reason to stay in Mass anymore at the time because I was kind of on the trajectory I am now with teaching and trying to teach firearm stuff in a non-firearm related state is kind of like slamming your head into a wall and wondering why it hurts sort of thing. So I decided to kind of cut my ties and move north to where I now live here in New Hampshire, or as we call it, the Shire. And I've been living here since 2014. Uh, when I moved up here in 2014, I was still kind of teaching on the side, uh, teaching with another locally based training company, uh, kind of more outside of the classroom stuff, like more functional, get people moving with the gun, that sort of thing. Uh, but we're still doing it on the side, still a full time job. Uh, and as we all know, sometimes we got to do a job we hate in order to support those that we love from time to time. So hated the job, but it was what was necessary. It was my season, so to speak. We all have our seasons. And then finally in 2017, with a mortgage, a wife and three kids under my control, under my uh, watch, so to speak, I decided to leave the so-called safety of a uh, full-time corporate job with with benefits and job security and all of that to 
go and run with Rune Nation full time. And since then, uh, this this coming well, yeah, this past May just marked six years I've been doing this full time, and I typically teach between 40 to 45 seminars a year. Uh, I usually start around the February time frame, then end around December, just because trying to travel out of New Hampshire uh, between basically uh, middle of December to end of February is pretty difficult with just the snow and the shitty weather, whether you're flying or driving or whatever. So I'm kind of a homebody then, be a home run with the family, kind of revamp the site, do some more writing, that sort of thing. And then we kind of rinse and repeat the uh, the following year. So, so this year so far, I've been to Florida, South Carolina, Virginia twice, uh, Ohio, Michigan, um, due to be in Rhode Island uh, this coming weekend. And then I should be up in upstate New York with Frank over at Bull Creek, the uh, middle to end of September, back in Michigan in October. And then in November, I should be out in Indiana in Rhode Island again. So, yeah, just chugging along, man. We were talking a little bit before the show on how the, you, you feel like this year has been a little bit, you've been a little bit more focused on contentment and spending time like with family, balancing the work life part of that. And now that you've been in running Rune Nation for a while, I'm interested to hear where we're going to go with that. So before we actually get fully started, uh, I just want to say thank you to those who are supporting the show. Thank you to those who are supporting us over at redactedculture.locals.com, which one day I'll be able to say with a, like a fluid voice. Uh, and then just to kind of close it off, we are doing a set of pre-orders on our hoodies, which will get delivered before the fall, as well as our original white on black tees, the classic redacted tee. So if you want to jump on, on that pre-sale, now's the time to do it. Other than that, that's how we sponsor the show. That's how we keep ourselves rolling. Uh, thank you very much for how you guys have been helping out. So let's get into the, the bones about it. Um, Ian, when I met you a long time ago now, or what feels like a long time ago in the best of ways, you introduced to me a more thorough... Um, maybe a more personal explanation of what you were calling imposter syndrome. And I think that topic has come up a number of times within people on the show and then outside of even my sphere. And as we were talking earlier, you were really, you were, you, you kept mentioning this thing called contentment. And um, I, I really want to dig into that. Absolutely. So, so when you're talking, can you give me an example or give me, tell me what you mean by, how you like is that is this a transition from one to the other is one the antidote to the other how how would you describe imposter syndrome even within our milieu i mean in, in, imposter syndrome i think is only relevant to the individuals that um actually have a developed set of morals and uh are true to themselves overall and more or less have character you know there's plenty of individuals in this space of the gun industry that um do not have any form of imposter syndrome because they think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread and you know that's that's a that's the kind of polar opposite end to that which is you know your your level of cockiness or uh even people that i think have plenty of dunning kruger effect going on meaning that they perceive that they are uh, uh, more in control or are more skilled than they actually are because they haven't been, I guess, tested in one way or the other. Um, so I actually, <laughs> I have more trust in people that that openly say or claim or really feel true the fact that they have imposter syndrome than those that don't, you know, but there's also a balance where if you have too much of the imposter syndrome, then you don't have enough confidence in yourself to develop yourself or develop your product or develop your brand or whatever else. So uh, there, there, there's definitely a balance that needs to happen where you're aware, right? You're, you're aware that um, maybe you don't feel that uh, you're where you should be. Like you feel like you're kind of a fake, but you also are able to still kind of keep true to yourself and keep pushing on regardless of that, kind of shadowy thought that kind of lingers in the uh in the background of your mind so to speak uh but it, it's definitely something that i personally I, I wouldn't say struggle with because it you know it definitely doesn't affect my day to day um but i guess really what i do struggle with within that is you know when people uh give me compliments you know like really really honest 
heartfelt compliments. Um, I don't, I, I don't really know. Like, obviously it's, it's not like I get, I, I like immediately like be awkward and run away. I just don't know how to initially process it maybe as well as somebody who maybe is a little too full of themselves and they're just so used to, uh, you know, being praised, so to speak. Like I'm a very introverted person to begin with. Um, you know, when I'm not traveling and I'm home with my family, I literally either stay in my house and, you know, write, work out, do stuff, you know, around the lawn, mowing the lawn, whatever, dealing with the, dealing with the chickens, or I'm driving to into town to do jujitsu. And that's really about it. Yeah. You know, go, go out with the wife for a date or stuff like that, but I'm not. Uh, really outgoing person. I have my core group of friends that I see whenever I can and or that I chat to that I chat with on the regular. But I, I guess that also is that probably plays into the fact of the um, imposter syndrome is the is the fact of who I am just overall in general. Yeah, I'm. A, yeah, because I can be afraid. I not be afraid of, but there's a word that I'm looking for and it has to do with caution it's like if if somebody displays no humility, pride cometh before fall. This is not, you know, it's it's, it's a very long-standing saying. Yeah, coming from Proverbs in the Old Testament, and and so there's that element, and then there's another side to it where I think certain elements within the gun industry um, provide immediate feedback for hubris, and certain, yes. but there is also a long tail where sometimes i've seen people i've seen people in different training pipelines i've seen people in different professional uh, uh, positions sort of build their position in their community their environment their immediate circle on a bad foundation and that is like is what would you we'd call like pride or yes. arrogance or even brazenness and like you get and sometimes you get to know them and you realize that they're not the it, it's it's they're not the person that you thought they were like i have been wrong before where i thought somebody was say arrogant and then i got to know them and i realized that their um method their their like demeanor their their countenance was just so different than where i was from and so i interpreted something as arrogance where they were not in the same sense but at the same time that immediate feedback has come back for some people where they were over not overconfident but they had no humility but great skill sets and and it was somehow their character flaw that got them on the hook instead of their skill sets and that was that's an interesting it's it's just i think it's something that's so much more important to us especially in gun culture where your integrity does matter and we're very in tune with desiring that your your words to be equivalent to your actions. Your 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 confidence should measure up to your ability. And when it doesn't, we're very quick to point it out at the same Absolutely. time. So but at the same time, I think that even what you call imp imposter syndrome or what we're calling imposter syndrome can at, at a time become masturbatory of yes. like excuse making and refusing to act it's sort of that hesitation in the doorway if you're talking about CQB or it's yeah. but just just but just take away the metaphor of the training scenario and put it into human human interactions and that's where i see it happen you were talking about contentment before would you could you elaborate on that in its relationship to imposter syndrome yeah so i i guess the the, the the balance or the uh, I guess maybe the antithesis to imposter syndrome would be being able to find contentment because if you are content that means that the imposter syndrome you perceived wasn't actually a thing because you can't have contentment um, but also still not be confident in where you are and for me especially in the teaching subsect of the gun industry, because obviously within the gun industry, you have different subset category, whatever term you want to use. You have like, you know, people who are manufacturing things and then even in manufacturing, you're manufacturing, you know, firearms, manufacturing holsters, manufacturing night vision, 
Um, so the, the subsect that I'm in, I guess, would be in kind of the teaching, education, coaching realm. And, and within that, uh, there, there is definitely a lot of, um, I, I guess, a simple term that most people would understand would be peacocking. You know, because because it is a it is a very, and I hate to use the term, can't even see my fingers, but alpha. You know, the the whole like, I'm the king of the mountain. You know, I did so and so. I was the guy who did the thing in the place. No, well, well, I was the guy on the other team that did the other thing in the place. And it's this constant kind of bickering that it isn't useful at all. And and I understand that everybody needs to be the guy with the thing to attach to their brand or their company in order to, you know, uh, be able to be financially useful to themselves or their company. But at the same time, especially as, as educators, as, as coaches, as coaches, as, as teachers, you know, where we all have the same goal, we all have the same end state. We just have different paths of getting there. You know, like there's only so many ways to teach presentation from the holster you know whether you're a competitive shooting guy whether you're a law enforcement trainer whether you're you know the guy who did the thing in the place like there's only so many ways and you can make up words and go to with to a thesaurus and you know make it that much more interesting but at the same time like we're all trying to do the same thing and i just wish there was a lot more cohesiveness in this space instead of uh, immediately pointing out, well, he said it this way, it's wrong, you know, he's an idiot, uh, whatever it may be, or just the amount of just um, people, or again, educators that are so willing to pour effort into a platform that literally hates and despises everything that we stand for as an industry and i understand it's a pro and con you know we you know in order to market yourself that's the most efficient and modern way to do it is through social media but just the amount of just relentless never-ending content with some cool trap beat music and a zoom in a zoom out a cool filter over it um shilling some product that they've only had in their hands for maybe a couple of days saying it's the best thing since sliced bread. And for me, it's a hard balance because like, I'm, I'm going to be honest that I just have way too much uh, integrity to be that person. And maybe that potentially hurts the growth of Rune Nation or how many seats I fill in a seminar, but I'm content with that. I'm okay with that. If I'm able to like this morning, uh, if I'm able to, you know, uh, have a lazy morning with my wife and make some coffee in the morning, listen to some nice music, get on my emails, um, prep for the day, ride my motorcycle to jujitsu, help teach jujitsu, come back, and then prep for our podcast and still be financially stable, like not be like stressing about like, oh my God, am I going to have somebody fill this class? Because if not, I'm going to have to sell a gun or anything like that. Like to be not content in the sense of like not searching for something better, but being content in the fact that I'm okay where I am and I'm okay where with Rune Nation is in, com in comparison to what I see a lot of other say again in my space coaches doing you know like teaching uh you know like eight classes or 12 classes a month you know back-to-back -back weekends and they're you know pushing you know 20 guys through on a saturday and another 25 guys on a sunday and they're pulling out they're pulling out all the frills on their videos and they're posting every day if not twice a day and you know their their stories and their instagram is filled with a product like yeah, like if that's your thing, like if you want to be the guy that has, that's the trainer, the, 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 the instructor that is able to, you know, teach all the time and you're okay with being away from your house, you know, 90% of the month. And because you want to have the second house or the second boat or the side by side and all that type of stuff, like if, if that's what you want, cool, man, all the more power to you. But for me, like, 
if I can do what I do, if I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way, um, and I forget who I heard it from, but the way that I look at owning a business, again, whether it's here in the education industry, whether it's, you know, podcasts, whether you're a guy who makes gun parts, whatever, if you can do what you want, when you want, for how much you want, that's rich to me. That is contentment and that is being financially well in yourself and in your business. And, and the fact of the matter is we just live in a society, just again in grand scheme, not just talking about the gun industry, but we live in a society where people can't, not can't, but they refuse to develop that contentment because they always want that one more thing, that one more step. They are keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. They're constantly chasing after who they're comparing themselves to. In reality, the people they're comparing themselves to either A, don't even know who they are, or B, could even care less. And that I think is like a whole societal thing as a whole that we really ha have an issue with. And I understand that, you know, in order to develop better techniques, better products to grow an industry, you know, we have to kind of reach for more. But I also think it's a really hard line, a really hard balance for people to walk upon because they, they it's really difficult for them to find contentment because they always want more, 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 more. How do you, how do you distinguish contentment from complacency? And that's where, again, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult or blurred line that you definitely need the awareness to have uh, because uh, you, you know, even though I'm content where I'm at, it's not like I just give up and I'm like, oh, I'm just not gonna, I'm not just going to do my day-to-day -day thing I always do. That's where I feel that people start to fall off the rails where they are too content that it then falls into the line of complacency and then they just start giving up on themselves as a coach, as a product designer, as whatever, because they think this one thing that they have, they put all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. And then they, then they rely on that one thing and then say that one thing stops working or it gets outdated then they're like a hundred steps behind because they just kind of, or they more or less gave up on themselves or uh, steadily reaching for more um, at a, we'll say at a marathon pace, not a sprint. I, I feel like a lot of people kind of reaching for that more are kind of at a sprint pace where it's go, 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 go. Whereas for me, I'm kind of looking at being able to teach and being able to travel as more, at a marathon pace. Like I understand that I'm not going to be able to do this forever. You know, like even say a, a person that I look up to in the training space or the teaching space um, that I actually thankfully had the opportunity to take a class from and become good friends with is Kyle Lamb of Viking Tactics. Everybody that is anybody in the training space um, at least knows the name. Maybe I haven't met him, but if, you know, if, if, if you shoot guns more than say recreationally and you don't know who Kyle Lamb is, like you got a, <laughs> you got a bigger problem. Like he is like in, in, in my vision from a, me, myself as a teacher now, he's kind of like the godfather, you know, of the private, uh, sector training. Like he was one of the first guys I remember when I got out of the military that was actively, you know, traveling and putting on classes, rifle or pistol, or whatever. And yeah, he was the guy who did the thing in the place, but he also did it in a, probably the most humble manner possible. Just the nicest guy you'll ever meet and never once, you know, took time away from doing drills to talk about him being the guy who did the thing in the place. Everybody knew he didn't need to, you know, be cocky about it or spend time, you know, talking about the war stories. Um, but even Kyle doesn't, you know, teach or travel anymore. He's in his probably like early, maybe late fifties, early sixties at this point. I'm not too sure, but he's older now. And so I know I can't do this forever, but I also don't want to get to a point where I'm unhappy teaching. Like if I'm unhappy teaching, then that's, then I'll just go back to a regular corporate job and be unhappy and probably get paid more. Honestly, um, I, I, I want to do this a, and still be able to support the family, right? That's kind of the 
biggest thing whether people want to say like oh i do it for the students like yeah i do it for the students too but at the same time like i gotta feed my family sorry like that's the <laughs> that's just the way the world is you know but on the second point like yeah i i i do want to do it for the students in a healthy manner right if i'm like driving back to back to back to back weekends with non-stop like i'm doing nothing for my mental health and the students are going to get a subpar product because while I'm there teaching, I'm, I'm already in my head worrying about packing up and flying back out for the class I have the following weekend or like, oh, man, I haven't gotten waivers back from the guys for the class next weekend. And, and then it's taking away from the quality of the product. So for me, just like anything else, just as I'm sure with you, it's quality over quantity. And I feel like a lot of people, again, in this space have that flipped because they want to get to the thing, whatever their thing is faster when there is no there there is no life hack to this stuff again owning a business we're saying any uh, more specifically within teaching like to to become a better teacher yes you need the reps but you need the reps in a healthy manner in a in a manner that you enjoy uh, because again if i'm getting the reps just to get the reps and i'm just like so over it like i've taught and and, and this happened to me and i'm saying this because this has happened to me you know over the course of starting this business full time. Um, and I'm sure anybody else that is also a, an instructor full time that is maybe listening to this knows what I'm talking about. When 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 you leave that job security behind, you'll do just about anything within your level of moral and ethics in order to get your name out there more. And for me, because I'm not going to slap my name on a product and have that product fall, fall apart, I get my name out there by doing more classes. And I remember, I think it was 2019, I did five back to back to back to back weekends and they were all travel classes. It's not like they were five back to back, like locally here in New Hampshire, they were all stuff I had to fly to. So I would basically fly out on a Thursday or Friday, teach Saturday, Sunday, fly back Monday. And obviously like Monday in itself is a waste. Cause you know, usually, especially if it's a if I'm on the West Coast, I'm flying back from Oregon or Washington. I still don't get home till like, even if I leave the airport or fly at 6 a.m. there, I don't get home till like midnight because I have a small airport here in New Hampshire. So Monday's a ways. So then Tuesday, I'm still trying to get back and swing of things. And then by the next thing I know it, I'm already packing back up for the next Friday. And I remember I was teaching that fifth class in a row with walking pneumonia. <laughs> and then I was like, all right, something, something has to change. Like something and, has to and, give. Yeah, exactly. And now I'm more aware of just saying yes, just to say yes. And I understand that there's a lot of people out there who want the education and I totally support that. I'm all about it. But at the same time, like the last thing I want to do is to just go out there, just teach the class because ultimately I, it is to feed the family to, to do that. And then you as the student gets a subpar product and I'm not doing well for myself in the growth of Room Nation because I'm starting to hate what I do. And again, if I hate what I do, then I'll just go back to hating at a <laughs> hating my job at a regular job. You know, like I want to enjoy waking up every day and being like, yeah, man, I'm going to I'm, I th think I'm going to spend some time now writing. I think I'm going to start, you know, working on another zine. I think I'm going to uh, maybe push push out, make a, a, a post about my, my upcoming seminar. I got a pack for the seminar. I'm going to email so-and-so student, like that stuff that I actually enjoy doing. So it, it's definitely a, going back to your original question where um, complacency and contentment kind of very closely border each other. And it's really up to the end user to be, dare I say, hyper vigilant about that because it is a very, slippery slope that you can go from being content to next thing you know you're 100 steps behind because you got too complacent hyper vigilance i gotta just put this in i think i think when we see hyper vigilance external it's often it often comes at the price of the internal like if i can yes. be hyper vigilant about my environment it gives me a distraction from the chaos that's going inside my head or my yeah. heart yeah. uh so you you talking about this is, is like there's a certain part that I have I want to jump in on because yeah. when we talk about like contentment and the gun culture is uh, it, it, it's not that it's obsessed with gear but like gear is a really good metaphor for this one and and I and something that I'm encouraged by in gun culture is that we are witnessing it mature in a good way because let's just say 
the late 90s into the early 2000s was kind of like a waiting period where you had almost like a generational die off. And and it, there was all, all these things going on, like there was the massive distraction of the of 9-11 to the early war on terror. You had uh, the, the assault weapons ban, which stymied a lot of growth within the industry, whether it's maturity of instruction or availability of equipment. But now we are well beyond that and we can't live in that era anymore. We can't live in the glory days of 2013 when like everything was available and new instruction was popping up. And so when we look at individuals, when we look at gun culture people, like, you know, citizens, people who own firearms, this this whole like, whether it's dirty civilian, whether it's what you guys are doing, whether it's it's even just like the guy at home, I where we are frighteningly and consistently reminded that owning the firearm is not the end in itself. It is always pointing towards something. And while that can be turned into like a play on words, you own a firearm to defend your family. Without a family, it has no point. We're not all have gun, will travel people. And that life itself is mostly um, populated, not entirely, but mostly populated by people who are trying to figure out how to do these different things with their skill sets and so on and so forth. How to make money, how to how to run a business, how to be at home. And, it's, and the tragedy of like the contractor life is so is so repetitive. It's like, well, I'm on my 19th rotation, uh, but I, my third marriage is on the rocks or my second marriage is on the rocks. Yeah. And, and, and and you run into the massive question of what for or guys who serve a long and, and illustrious good career in, in like even special operations get out of the military and they're aimless. And 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 for the guy on the ground, like and, and I think this is I, I want to bring this forward and bring this all, all the way around to when we hear contentment, it's almost oft it's very often couched or framed in a conversation about gear. Stop chasing the, 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 the constant widget. This was even Josh Fralick, world championship competitive shooter. And he said it, what had to take him to go from good to great was to stop chasing widgets. And and that's a really it's a really good but easy description for gun culture 2015, where widgets were coming out, gear was coming out, new stuff was available, pop 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 pop, go on and grow. But now that gun culture has matured in so many ways, away from just the stuff and things to even what you might want to call lifestyle, what you want to call culture, what you want to call training, we are still reminded that complacency and contentment are factors that we have to deal with as individuals. Why would I want to train and get so good at something at the cost of that which it is designed to protect? And it, we come back to that story, and I, it's been interesting hearing you talk about it as an instructor because there is integrity in being an instructor for the people who you're teaching with, where if you lose that integrity and you just start chasing fame the widget that it's not even the widget now it's the maneuver or whatever um that is very different than an ambition an ambition to like achieve and build but that achievement and building cannot come at the cost of that which it's supposed to provide for um is that is, is that am i confusing in what i'm saying there yeah, or is no, it pretty no 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 it's a, it, and i just feel that you know, especially again in the uh, in the teaching space, specifically uh, where there a lot there's a lot of people that are uh, attached to trying to unlock the, I guess, key to the social media algorithm, like try how to figure out how to push their product, whatever it is, um, within this space which in reality isn't real life you know like I'll, I'll, you'd, you'd be surprised the amount of illustrious you know private sector instructors out there who have a lot of skeletons in their closet and they appear to be one thing on social media but in real life you find out that it's nothing of the sort and it's very easy to maneuver in that space when you're able to frame who you are and what your thing is in a very segmented space more specifically in a 60 to 90 second window you know 
um, especially with how the algorithm is now where obviously most of the content is now spread in reels you know like it's been said in the past but specifically on instagram that you know photos really aren't a thing anymore like if you want tr quote unquote traction with your post it needs to be in some form of a reel and that's where like people's attention span have has gone you know like people don't care usually about you know taking the time to actually read the caption to a specific post they just want either you know a cool picture of a gun with a cool filter on it a cool angle and then like have some some uh famous quote below it with a cool hashtag or even better some spicy reel with a like i said a cool filter on it and they're you know getting in and out of a helicopter or something I, like i don't know just something that attracts the uh <laughs> the majority of the uh of the gun culture when in reality like what as you were saying like what are you training for like why why are you in this space is it because you want to be uh you want to get into competitive shooting right you want to get to a master grandmaster level in uspsa maybe is it because uh you want to defend yourself or your family so you're more in the self-defense mindset uh, but you'd be surprised the amount of people that really aren't even in any of those two spaces which i really think like that's really about it i mean there's also the collectors too you know the people that want to clone stuff all the cloners and that's you know so you have like competitive shooters you have tactical guys and you have kind of the collectors slash cloners over here. That's really kind of what I envision as the three main category of people within the gun industry. But there's so many people that are very ambiguous with what they want out of this space. When in reality, it's they want to be the guy that has the, the thing and they kind of end up developing this identity around being that guy with the thing and having identity is okay you know people you know especially in like a in like a very uh in a very you know buddhist uh yogic way of thinking you know to remove the ego you know when in reality like you can't remove the ego like it's how your consciousness lives is through an ego and that's okay you seem to be aware of that that's the problem is people have have an ego or a heavy identity with that ego, but they're unaware of it. And they allow them, and in 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 it because they're not aware of it, it drives them in a direction or um, to be a certain thing that they, <laughs> that really doesn't work out too well for them in, in the long run because they are unaware of where this identity and this ego is driving, so to speak. It, it, it has taken the wheel so to speak as long as you're aware of it like when you like say something as simple as what we were talking about before high ready low ready right if you're aware like you're you you're looking at the comment section you're that guy you go in the comment section of a post and you see people get into it and you're starting to type out like this whole thesis as to why high ready is the worst thing since sliced bread and then before you hit send you go up oh, there goes my ego again there i go again and then you hit the erase, you take a step back and you don't even post a damn thing because you're aware of where that, <laughs> where that emotion is driving you. And especially, you know, when you are younger, your ego, or should I say, sorry, not your ego, your, your emotions drive a lot of things because you're starting to develop, you know, these emotions as a young adult. And then obviously with age, usually comes wisdom, not all the time, usually though, hopefully. And then you start to be aware of those emotions and how badly they can unintentionally guide you. And I really feel like being um, not, I'll, 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 I'll say it, uh, to be sensitive to these things. And, and again, the word sensitive as a whole has a really horrible connotation to it as people hear the word sensitive, especially a in our society and b in our society within the gun space oh my god people freak out oh my god you're 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 a sensitive snowflake this and that but i look at using the word sensitive as to just being more aware of what a your body is doing as a whole but what you're doing 
uh, also emotionally, like how you're interacting with your environment. Like, are you interacting with good people that are like good for your health and good for your growth as a person, or good for, good good for your whole uh, good for your growth in your business, or are you friending these people uh, just because they're the guy who can eventually get your foot in the door for the thing? Um, I, think, so, I think I think the word you're looking for is discerning. I might be wrong. Yeah. Like yes. I, I know sensitive has like a cultural implication of like essentially being soft. Yes. And I don't mean soft as in, because it, it like sensitive, the, the good side of being soft would be like uh, ha being able to be vulnerable. Yeah. Right. So like, if you want to have community, you have the, one of the sacrifices you have to put, take down is that wall that yeah. prevents you from being vulnerable. And if you're not willing to humble yourself in vulnerability before people, then you're not going to be you're not going to find yourself in that kind of community that your let's just say heart longs for but you've you've given me so much to like i want to work on and uh i think one of them's gone now so there goes that tv <laughs> there goes that tbi memory um, <laughs> it's okay but yeah like as we are addressing this as a culture and as we are we are becoming aware of it one thing that i hope that our generation does better than the generation past is that we pass on values and character development more deliberately. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it, you could even paraphrase it into like generations. One thing that the boomer generation did really well is that they, um, one of the things that the, the boomer generation did well is that when they had children, they raised them within a generally safe home, more or less to speak, like in, in, in compared to other examples. And some of that is just me drawing from like my family history. Yeah. But the one of the things that even gun culture has 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 struggled to pass on from what we'd call you could like in a in a negative sense call the FUD generation is yeah. that they they didn't pass on like the 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 heart and soul of the industry very well. No, it's there, there's so many like in in exchange in some ways maybe for like the massive industry like let's not look at it small having massive companies like Daniel Defense to Spiritus Systems to cry precision to like the and these are all big names gentex uh ops core um it, it, the proliferation of gear the, me the the mechanism by which that is available through the market like these are all good things that were passed on and we do ourselves and our and our ancestors a disservice when we only let only stack up the ills that they've done we also do them them a disservice when they we give ourselves and them credit for things that weren't passed on so if we can pass on to the next generation of gun culture or even our, our children in that sense a more philosophically astute understanding of what we believe and how we think about training and how we build a family and how we do all these kind of things whether it goes from homesteading to learning self-defense to constitutional carry versus you know states rights and, and all this other kind of garbage right um I, I i think that that's something worth aspiring towards that we are not without the tools to intellectually and let's just call it morally engage with our own people and it sound it may sound a little bit like a segue but if you are that that ego i think that the dark side of the ego that we see in the industry so long so much is that if you are constantly angered by what you see on in gun culture you're probably in the wrong corner of gun culture yeah if, if everything that you leave with is disappointment and anger that is followed immediately by inaction you're probably in the wrong corner and it's not that there isn't there aren't skeletons to in the closet it's not that there aren't you you know people making uh careers on on even acts, acts that are as egregious as stolen valor yeah you know because that happens and stolen valor is, isn't stolen valor isn't something that we consider disdainful simply because it's claiming something about being in the military it's that you are lying about who you are and you are selling something you are selling a false story and when we read stories of heroism in the battlefield or heroism in politics like genuine sacrifice and genuine character and people say you know it, like those things inspire us to greatness in the same way that if you look on Instagram and you see something that somebody else is doing that's really cool, and I mean just in the generic sense, it's really cool, 
and you see that as something that attacks your character that might be that, that it, it only sticks if it's if there's something within you that's feeling it that's sensitive not sensitive in the in the good sense of like vulnerable but don't always be taken away by what people have or do and yeah. And it, it's it has balance. Like we have to have balance. But I I don't I don't like the idea that you can find some sort of cynicism, that you can settle with cynicism as well. Every in every in every uh, influencer is a shill. Every instructor is a liar. Every veteran's a fake. Every you know what I mean. It's just like if you're always in that spiral that everyone's out to get you, that you're just being kept out of every corner. Like either it's true and it's probably you. Kind of like that Jordan Peterson quote that if like if it's if you're having if you're a guy trying to get into a relationship with a girl and none of them are working out, it it can't be a pro it's less likely that it's a problem with all women and it's more likely a problem with just you. Yeah, it's you know it's it's the equivalent to the people you know the not the boomers but the doomers you know the the people that are uh, you know uh, masturbatory this idea of you know, the, the end of the world and their preppers and, you know, their uh, nihilist in all the sense of the word uh, where they, you know, don't believe in any form of hope. It's all, it's only going to get worse. And yeah, like if you, <laughs> you keep believing that, sure. Yeah. It's probably, it's probably going to happen. And, you know, that, that's, that's, not, that's also not to say that you um, believe that the world is nothing but rainbows and unicorns and the government's here to help. It's just, again, having that overwhelming sense of uh, understanding your environment, um, your surroundings, and more importantly, yourself as to where you start getting unintentionally drawn into things that really don't need your effort or attention. Um, because I, I really think that our society is really struggling with the idea of finding a purpose. You know, like I tell people or I've told in the past, especially in the, in the gun industry, you know, if somebody, if somebody like were able, if they were able to magically uh, poof and disappear your guns on the spot, what would you be without your guns? You know, like what, what do you have to offer to the world? If all that you look at is I'm the gun guy or I'm again, the guy who did the thing and they take that away. Like, what do you still have to offer to the world? You know, like, can you still offer quality information? Can you still offer a quality product outside of the one thing that you're good at. And that's why I, I really strive to be as, um, to, to quote my friend and mentor, Craig Douglas of Shivworks, to be as, as multidisciplinary as possible, you know, to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. You know, like if, if you want to master, however, I will put a caveat to that. If you do want to be obviously a master at something, again, like a master, grandmaster level shooter, then you have to focus literally all of your effort on a day-to-day -day basis to getting to that one single goal. You know, you, you have to dedicate all of your efforts to that, all, all your effort goes to, you know, dry fire time, live fire time, ammo, and focusing on getting to as many matches as you can. Um, if, if that's your thing, awesome, man, more power to you. But for me, I look, especially from a teaching perspective, I try to um, be able to offer my patrons um, as a wide array of information as possible, whether it's in the, even in the unarmed topic, like being able to understand how uh, criminals work, so to speak, how, how they, how they go about their day-to-day -day life in the street, how to verbalize with people on the street, how to de-escalate if you need to, how to uh, potentially see the attack before it's coming how to, you know, understand your environment from a macro perspective. And then obviously if that fails, which obviously that's why I think those who own and carry and train with guns have them is because they understand like being able to see the pre-assault cues or 
be able to de-escalate or be able to see the threat ahead of time isn't a guaranteed thing. Therefore, they need to have a contingency plan in place, just like in the military, we had what's called an EOF, just like you had an escalation of force. You know, if, if they're trying to come past, say, a traffic control point and, you know, uh, say that the green dows doesn't work, then you shoot off a flare. Flare doesn't work. Then you start going, you know, to the ground, to the grill, and eventually, you know, you go for that lethal shot. So it's kind of the similar thing with here just focusing and again this is more talking about in a self-defense sort of thing because that's obviously what i adhere to if you want to go become a better competitive shooter there's plenty of quality competitive shooters out there who teach and those should be the people that you should seek after um but again that's why i look to have a wide array of um, information to give to students so as not to get narrowed in and have my identity or my ego be this one single thing so that if something is amiss and I'm not able to do that one thing anymore, I still have something else that I can put all of my effort and my happiness into. Okay. So I'm going to frame this question with the macrocosm. The big picture is gun culture as a whole. And the individual microcosms are specific skill sets and equipment. In it's not uncommon to see this. It's not uncommon for me to encounter this format of a uh, let's just say an argument, and that is the never ending, um, the never ending rat race. And in a microcosm of let's just say gear, it might be the rat race is something like. You have a rifle, now you get got to get an optic. You have a fully loaded rifle, now you got to get a suppressor. You got a fully loaded rifle and suppressor, now you got to get a plate carrier. Now you got to get a plate carrier, now you got to get a radio, now you got to get a helmet and night vision. Now you got a night vision, now you got to get a razor, and you got to get a side-by-side, -side, and then you got to get a helicopter, and then you need to get a jetliner, and then you need to get a fucking A-10 bomber or an A-10 warthog, right? It's just like... Brrr. If yeah. you were gonna, If you were to play that game, the rat race, of just within the microcosm of gear, we know... Like that's the usefulness of that as a microcosm as we can see it in real time, even in ourselves. When I'm like, I don't actually want this because or I, I want this, but I don't need it. And then we can create like an inversion, like a dark. Let's call it a dark rat race of like minimalism where you, it's almost like asceticism in philosophy of like I, the, I am better because I have less. And in the, it's just this kind of weird zipper line of of gun culture within a, a gear but then you expand it a little bit larger to, to larger to the rat race of gun culture and it kind of looks like this you know so you've got a gun now you get training now you got training now you add uh another you know you add you've gone from you buy a gun you learn you get your concealed carry your permit to carry you learn how to shoot a handgun then you buy a rifle then you take a couple rifle classes then you go to a cqb class then you go to an urban recce class then you go to an urban recce and sustainment class and the argument that it looks like when I call it a rat race is that, oh, so it, it always is framed as, oh, so you think that it's all about the gun. You should learn jujitsu. Now you should learn uh, yeah. uh, you should learn software defined radios. Then you should learn hacking. Then you should learn lock picking. Then you should learn. Then you should learn. And it's like and, 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 and why I call it a rat race is that um, it's not it, it, why I call it a rat race is it's a substitution of having an end goal by a never-ending pursuit of the current thing or even what if you're forward thinking your anticipation of what the next thing is going to be right it would have been great to be a professional in let's just call it urban recce in 2019 because in 2020 that that was everywhere and just because of riots and then it exploded yeah. into the media sphere and like and why i'm calling it a rat race is in the framing of contentment uh, and I want to hear. I, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this one. Is in the framing of contentment, uh, we can see the rat race in the microcosm of gear, but we can also see the rat race happen in the macrocosm of the industry. Of unless you're the owner of Daniel Defense, you're not really playing the game, or you know, or unless you're a Navy SEAL, you're not really playing the game. Unless you're this, you're not really you know that. And those that argument is. Is difficult because there's a certain relevancy to the claim and that is you know like if you're if you don't have night vision you can't play the night vision game oh, oh, okay yeah that that makes sense I know but the pursuit of the next current thing 
is a poor substitute for what you were calling earlier as contentment. As an instructor within the training environment, how do you see that rat race play out with skill set development? And how have you found yourself as an instructor and as a student counter that and turn it into something productive? Um, well, it's definitely very easy, I think, as a, in, in, a, as a teacher, as an educator to get drawn in to potentially teach things that you have no realm in teaching because um, students somehow believe that you do know how to do those things. Like I'll take, for example, you know, I had a guy reach out to me a year or so ago that wanted me uh, to ask me if I would teach, you know, a quote unquote CQB style class for um, his agency. And, you know, I, I frankly and honestly told them, like, I, I could if you wanted me to, but my stuff, you know, <laughs> I'm not currently active in that space, so to speak. Um, the stuff that I had learned was over a decade old. So, yeah, you know, I could do it, but I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, that's going to be completely outdated. And it'd be very easy for me as a person with legitimacy in the teaching space to put those moral and ethics aside to know, yeah, you know, I could probably teach some of that and make some extra money, make some of the agency and totally say, okay, yeah, I can do that and write them up a quote. Um, but again, th th this is where th that hard line needs to be drawn as to um, having that line drawn for yourself of moral and ethics. And that's so subjective to the individual because it all, I think, comes from upbringing as a whole, you know, how you were brought up, were you brought up with those, you know, uh, levels of moral and ethics to then carry you into, into adulthood and therefore into uh, as a business owner. Um, but I also, you know, are, am really taken back when people immediately, when somebody disagrees with them over something so minuscule that they immediately as the so-called subject matter expert in that specific space say you should stay in your lane um and that's another in my opinion hard not hard but very vague line to establish yourself on you know as a um as a teacher because they're because the the, the ironic thing about an industry is usually in an industry there's some form of a metric or standards that the industry holds themselves to. And in the gun industry, specifically the teaching space within the gun industry, it is so subjective. There is no like garnering association or organization that says, oh, so-and-so is a you know, instructor. I mean, yeah, there are some, you know, you have the generic NRA and USCC and, and, and that type of stuff. Like I, I get that. But they'll, you know, that's like a puppy mill training organization to begin with. But uh, overall, for people that do own their own business as an as a teacher, it, it's it, it is very vague as to the standards. So because of that, it's very simple and easy sometimes for people to say they can teach something when they really shouldn't be. But at the same time, you also need to understand where you can offer something even though you might not be a expert but you do have some subject matter in it you know and for me that was a very difficult line for still is for me to uh be on when i teach my uh combatives related stuff because i'm not a black belt in jujitsu you know i just got my brown belt i've been i've been teaching my combative stuff since i was a four stripe blue belt and even then i was like i, I like i was confident in myself in teaching the content but in the back of my mind i'm like again that <laughs> full circle here that imposter syndrome coming in like well i'm only a four stripe blue belt what do i have any relevancy talking in the space but then afterwards we conclude the seminar and I get the AARs back, you know, as we're going around handing out certs from the students and they, you know, said like, oh, this is amazing. I've never 
heard it spun that way or whatever it is. So then you're like, okay, well, maybe I do have something to offer. So it's, it's, it's a very, well, like I said, like this, I feel like this whole conversation we're having here is surrounding the fact of being uh, very aware of yourself at all times, um, not in an anxious PTSD ridden sense, so to speak, but um, not getting into a certain spot and just uh, being over content and more into the complacent side of things. Um, so yes, I'm content where Rune Nation is currently uh, with how, with my schedule, with, uh, again, being able to balance that work family balance, but I'm also not over content in the fact of that to a point where it starts slipping into this level of complacency. And then usually when people get complacent and it doesn't go in their way, that's where they start pointing fingers and they say, oh, well, it's because of so-and-so, or it's, you know, so-and-so's fault that I'm not, you know, where I want to be or whatever else. So it, it, it easily is kind of this, this trickle down effect, so to speak. I don't know if I answered your question or not. You did. It's not an easy question to answer. And yeah. I probably phrased a massive, I, I phrased it in a very large scale. The, the one way that I'd ask you to clarify is, is as an instructor, I'll change it to a question. As an instructor, when you're in the realm of teaching, you're teaching skill sets, we're not talking about gear, we're not talking about any of that. How, and, and this is your chance to kind of say something that maybe wouldn't be appropriate as much within a class itself, uh, because you have time, you have time yeah. here. But it's if you were to try to communicate contentment within a skill set development, how would you do that? I, I would say if you can repeatedly hit a say if we're talking about shooting specifically because obviously trying to give an answer to all the different realms within self-defense is uh that's a that's a that's a big piece of cake uh or a big piece of the pie so to speak um but for shooting if you can consistently hold yourself to a rigorous uh, set of standards for yourself, um, in my opinion, cold. Cold performance, in my opinion, is the best way to measure a skill set in shooting. Um, if anybody has ever come to my seminars or anyone's listening knows that I'm a big proponent on what we call a cold start or a what's commonly referred to in the military as a CTE or a cold test evaluation. Uh, it's basically the first drill that you do at the range. Um, it's basically you show up at the range, set up your target, load up your magazines accordingly to that cold start. Uh, preferably the cold start has two characteristics, a definitive part time, which for those of you listening again, that may not be super into shooting is a part time is a time you're looking to complete the drill by. And a, and the second part is a, uh, definitive accuracy standard. Cause again, if you're not shooting for accuracy, why are you shooting at all? And you're doing that once through. That is the only time that's not your best out of 10. It's not like, oh, that was a mulligan. I'll try it again. You have one run. It's the first run that you do. After that, yeah, you can still, like, there's nothing, there's, there's no over governing body that's going to plop down and say, you can't do it again. Obviously, you can do it again, but it's not going to count for shit. If anything, you're just going to fuel your ego, right? You're going to be like, oh, well, I did it the second time through, right? So it's the first first run that counts. If you can consistently hit a set of rigorous cold start standards, for yourself um and and again it's still very subjective because there are so many different cold start standards out there so it's really hard to narrow down as to which ones i would pick specifically because everyone will say oh this one's better this one's best but just holding yourself accountable in your shooting every time you are the range and again what is every time again very subjective that's going to come down to you know your uh how much work you have as a, at your regular job. Let's say you're a regular everyday person, right? You've got a regular nine to five job. You got a family, you got life, you got vacation, you got stuff like that, all that to balance. So however often you can consistently get to the range and hold yourself to that standard, I would say that you're pretty well off. Um, for, for combatives, 
whether it again be boxing, Muay Thai, grappling, you know, as a whole, jujitsu, sambo, judo, whatever, that's even more subjective because I can tell you that even taking a week off, even at my almost 11 years into this, it can completely disrupt your progress. Not like, oh my God, the world is over. Why do I even do this anymore? But I, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was down teaching the the military down in New, New Jersey for a week. You know, I got to roll once when I was there, but it was like right after I got off the range and I was smoked and I only got to, you know, spar twice. So when I came back to my gym on that Monday, man, I was definitely feeling it. So I, from a combative standpoint, what it like, what standards or when, when you should feel that you are all set. Um, I don't really perceive that there is really a standard or a set that you're like, okay, I'm, I'm okay with this. You know, if, if, if I were to say that you only have a certain amount of time to get in and say again, narrowing this down to just say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, because that's what I know. That's what I do most often. I would say if you're, if, if you, all you have is six months and you dedicate those six months to just Jiu Jitsu and you are able to get in three to four times a week um, for those six months, I would say that after leaving that, you would be pretty set for the most average situation you may be encountered in in an uh, in a uh, within two arms range conflict. Now, obviously, the danger to that is if you can't regularly practice and retain those techniques, you will very quickly fall off the rail, so to speak. Um, and and that I think is even like I said, more apparent in specifically grappling. Uh, Cause I, you know, I, I would say you can still keep your skill set up pretty well in striking arts like boxing or Muay Thai. If you have pads in a, you know, bag in the basement, you can, you know, spar against the bag and yeah, you can got, get like jujitsu dummies, you know, that are just like, you know, sit there on the floor, just like a dead bug. And you can, you know, work like neon belly and passing and transitioning all that, but it's still, doesn't equal the fact of how an, an entangled uh, situation is going to work out. Just like, you know, I, I guess you could even say the same for, for striking, right? Like no, like a, a bag isn't going to really work out if someone ends up being southpaw or if they end up blocking or they end up, you know, angling off and using angles. So the, the sparring stuff uh, can only get you so far, which I guess in a sense is doing flat range drills and live fire, right? If you really want to see how you hold up specifically in a real altercation, that's where you then level up from shooting on a flat range USPSA cardboard and doing, you know, sub two second build drills to going in a house with airsoft or UTM, like my guys, like my boys over at core vision training do. And that's all that they do. That's all that they teach is, is the structure stuff or going to Craig's ECQC and seeing how well you stand up in a entanglement with SIM guns, right? That's kind of where you would actually put your sparring quote unquote on the range to the, to some type of metric. And for most people, for, for most gun purists, as I, as I personally call them, people that look at just the owning the gun as this magical talisman, that's a very far stretch to try to get them to go to those type of courses because they are extremely rigorous. Uh, there's a lot of work involved. There's a lot of thinking involved. Um, you usually leave battered and broken, you know, not like literally broken. I mean, sometimes, but, <laughs> you know, maybe more mentally broken, I hopefully than physically broken, but you, you end up a change individual. And sometimes that change people can't accept. They're okay with failing, you know, maybe a cold star because they'll say, oh, it's the ammo or, you know, it's the, the, you know, mercury is in retrograde or the gravitational pull in this area of the range is a little off or whatever. They can make any bullshit they want. But when you're, when you're put face to face with another individual that's intentionally trying to stop you from doing that technique, say, like I said, in a uh, entanglement shooting course like Craig's or in a structure based force on force course, like, um, like Kyle offers over core vision, there's really no excuse to be made there. Like you were put up against an opponent that is a human 
being just like you and you lost you know it's it's not the fact of the gear it's i mean of course you can obviously attach those excuses to them but the fact you're in front of other people you're in front of students you're in front of the instructor and now you just got shot or just got you know rammed to the ground there there is no excuse to be made so it's it's very difficult to try to get those people to go those type of courses so that's really in my opinion where you can really see those standards hold up and again if you're not a self-defense guy then the next level up if you're a competitive shooting guy would be then to go to obviously start going to local matches uspsa steel challenge stuff like that because that's again going to be the close you're going to get in that specific context yeah it's there's 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 the duality i mean on the one hand we're dealing with like a, a difficult market right now in the sense of the economy has its own challenges um, but even then in the gun culture, I do believe that that mentality of, um, guns only like the gun is a talisman thing. The gun is a magic wand. I, I don't, maybe it's, maybe it's where I sit in my little ivory tower, my little golden, yeah. my little golden garage yeah. right now, but I don't yeah. actually see it. I don't see that as much as I, as, as, I, as I used to. And I don't see it as much as I don't, I don't, I don't see that as the standard anymore. I, yeah, I, yeah, my, I, I, I am encouraged by gun culture to see that th for the majority of people that I that I the, the majority of the interactions that I have, whether it's through the Internet or in real life, there is not as nearly as much of the, uh, there's not that mentality of like the gun as a talisman is a very let's just call it low low society mentality. Like I, I, I think I'm more likely to encounter that with a criminal than I am with like a a gun culture person and yeah, but, yeah. Th there there is certainly a hesitancy there's certainly like this is there there's a hesitancy within gun culture to even step out of the shooting frame but at the same time as that it's not i don't know if it's always an easy transition like it's it's you go from the unknown to nothing to owning a gun and then you go from that unknown to learn that that known of owning a gun to like becoming proficient with it. And then once becoming proficient with it become moves away from unknown or an unknown to a known. Now you have more. And we are I believe that we're in the exploratory phase of that within a culture as a whole. Like there are certainly individuals who are exceptions to this rule, but culture as a whole is in the exploratory phase of Dude, CQB classes for the civilian have not been around very long. Uh, EQ, yeah. ECQC classes for the civilian have not been around very long. I mean, they have in their microcosms, but but uh, but it's like it's a growing expanse, and I I am encouraged that though there are people who will rest on their laurels, they're not they're not my concern. They're not. I don't know how many. I don't know how much of a of a, a grasp they have anymore. I think that they're they're on a decline. I don't. Uh, I'm torn because I think we should. I think we need to cut it off here, and then we need to we need to get okay. ready for the next part. Unless you okay. have a unless you have something you want to jump in on, no. and then we'll let's wrap it up. Okay. Are you still? Yeah, you're good. I, I can't tell. But I'm sitting a little. There you go. We, I know. Sorry. I know. The, I know the computer's working. It's like yeah. technical difficulties have been the plague of the century. But all right. So, um, we're we're gonna get started with another one. But okay. before we do, where do people find you? Where do they find your content? Where do they find your? You said you've been moving away from social media, which might mean it takes a little bit more more work to find you. Where's that yes. done at? Uh, so if you, my website is rune nation llc.com on there uh, where i do most of my content production posting is through a, a three dollar paywall called thought crimes and it essentially on there i'm able to explore ideas that would be more than likely censored or pushed to the bottom of the all-seeing all-knowing algorithm um, that we use on these modern <coughs> social platforms so it's 30 cents a day you know it's a very low um, entry point, but on there, I post every single day, still post on social media, maybe once a week, uh, that my Instagram handles Rune Nation, Facebook is Rune Nation, same thing with, uh, with Twitter, um, and all of my courses 
and products that I offer, uh, more soft goods, t-shirts, stickers, sweatshirts, stuff like that. You can all be found on my website uh, for my remaining 2023 dates for seminars. That's currently on the website under the uh, calendar as well. All righty. Well, we're just going to have to become competitors here because because <laughs> that's how it works, though. And I really Absolutely. appreciate I really appreciate what you've been doing. Uh, thank you for coming on for this part. And let's get ready for the second one. Uh, for those who have been listening, if you want to support the show here, you can or our, instead of doing thought, thought crimes, we have the black site, which is redactedculture.locals.com. I know we're going to let's do some cross pollination here in the near future. I think it'd be pretty fun. Absolutely. Um, let's let's. Uh, I, I want I, I am I am subscribed to your palavers and those are I'm pronouncing that right, right? Yes. Pala yep. palaver, palaver, palaver. Yep. Uh those are those are you know, a, a refreshing piece in my inbox when they come through because it's like, oh good. It's business, but it's also enjoyable. So thank um you. So Ian, thank you very much. For those who are still listening, you can support us. You can pick up our join in our pre-sale for our redacted tees and our redacted hoodies which are going are scheduled to be delivered before fall so that you'll get them just in time for that first cold winter or that first cold pop crack in as fall breaks upon us that being the case that's over at redactedllc.com i should know my own stuff better but um this call this podcast is focused on the ideas the philosophy the beliefs what we think to be right and true and good that build that foundation for gun culture so that as we proceed through our own individual experiences that we have something to pass on to the next generation uh it, it the idea in its core is you know it, it's nice that my grandfather may have passed on to me his rifle and he also was able to pass on to me ideas and i, I want to make sure that gets cemented in our culture so that as we grow as individuals, we grow as a community, we can spread out of our isolated corner as social media likes to treat us and continue to bleed out into America and Americana as a whole, and then reinstitute that base of values that instead of just complaining about it in politics, that America doesn't have any values anymore. Like we get to reinstitute that by choice, deliberately in an everyday passion, in an everyday pattern. So Anything that's not done daily is not done at all was a thing that is a piece of conviction that's challenged me for a long time. Thank you very much for listening and go forth and conquer.